welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where we share all kinds of tips, advice, and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Each episode is a conversation with inspiring people who make wonderful contributions to our knowledge in these areas and spark curiosity and ideas to pursue. Join me, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. Your job online or in a lot of ways actually in selling in general is really to disrupt someone's daily patterns or get them out of their their sequence of, of life and it's, it's you know how can you come in and stand out from all the other noise that that people are getting hit with with advertisements cold calls cold emails uh everyday thing chores they have to do in life how, how are you disrupting that how are you doing something outside of the norm that other people are not <laughs> Hi there, Innovator. It's great to be back with another episode. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. I trust too that you enjoyed my recent conversations with Chris Yankolovsky of Remote Staff and with J. Scott Christensen, expert about all things artificial intelligence and machine learning. I'm really excited today to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest, Anthony Sarandria, founder of SiteFlood. He's helping countless companies across the world grow their business through a wide array of innovative digital marketing methods. He runs a profitable portfolio of websites ranging from commerce to content blogs and his award-winning company SiteFlood works with businesses of any scope and any budget to find the most efficient way to grow their business through a variety of means. A quick promotional message from our sponsor, that's InnovaBiz, where we help coaches and consultants build professional credibility, engage their target audience and connect with their ideal client. That requires absolute clarity about who your ideal clients are and how you can help them. To help you get that clarity about your ideal client, take a look at our Marketing Master Mini Class, where... In less than 30 minutes, you'll gain absolute clarity on your ideal client and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. Access the Marketing Master Mini Class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. In our discussion today, Anthony talked to me about hiring for character over skill set. He explained how he finds perspective and gratitude from his philanthropic work. And he also advised that we all should get really comfortable with failure, learning from it and building resilience to bounce back. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Anthony Sarandria. Hi, I'm your host Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from Phoenix, Arizona in the USA, Anthony Sarandria. He's the founder of SiteFlood, he's an entrepreneur, a keynote speaker and a philanthropist. Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, Anthony. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Thanks for having me, brother. I'm excited to be here. Now, you're known as one of the top customer generators in the world, so I, I, every business, of course, is really interested in generating customers, so I'm really looking forward to exploring that. But before we get into all things lead generation, marketing, business growth, and so on, give us a bit of a high-level snapshot of your background. How did you get to where you are today? How did you develop that success, grow site flood, and what were some of the key moments in that journey? Yeah, no, th- thanks. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I started in... Uh... In sales, actually, in uh, a traditional door-to-door sales, cold calling sales, things like that, and uh, uh, stumbled upon this little thing called the internet that allowed me to infinitely reach uh, a number of people uh, without having to geographically or time base be limited to uh, that impact or that sale for me. And that became really addicting to think that I could get in front of, you know, a million people in eight hours or even in an hour, depending on how much you're, you know, what you're doing online. Uh, to influence them to actually take an action or buy something or sell or you know pick up the phone and call or sign up for a service or 
whatever that is. So that stuck with me even to this day, just that that addiction around that. And uh, it's it's really propelled the, the growth of where we're at today, just to to you know wrap our heads around that that idea or that theme. So you know, practically what that meant was that went from you know uh, grinding it out, you know, door knocking and cold calling and and doing all that good stuff, all the way up to hiring friends and family to grow in a team of 30 plus to, you know, doing, doing six figures a day in sales today. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So I, I think you're probably the first person I've spoken to that started out with door to door sales, particularly in, yeah, in the sure. sort of relatively modern era. So did you enjoy that? Uh, no, but uh, uh, the, the experience that came with it, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I think I, yeah, I had the foresight enough to know while I was going through it was like, this felt like training camp for like football or, you know, soccer or whatever, you know, what or basketball, you know, what like it felt like I was going through training camp. I was really like just busting my, my, you know, what to, to really sharpen my chops and learn, you know, the ins and outs of selling and developing thick skin and, you know, see how do you grab someone's attention in three seconds and gain their trust in five seconds, you know, to actually listen to what the heck you have to say and, and all those good qualities that I think, you know, are still overly uh, applicable today with, uh, you know, I think a lot of selling today really is like door to door. It's really, you only have such a, with people's attention span, you have such a short time to really not only get their attention, but build trust uh, very, very rapidly and quickly. And uh, I think that that those same principles have moved through today. So, I mean, short answer, I, I, I did not know I didn't, and which is what part of what led me to where it is today, but I, I got incredible uh, learnings out of it that I get to apply today in a function that I do actually love and I do enjoy, which is, you know, doing this, you know, similar concepts over the internet. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how do you apply those, um, learnings that you got there, particularly the, you know, capture the attention in a few seconds and cap and gain trust in, in a very short space of time as well onto the internet uh, when you don't have, visual contact you're not live at the same time with the person yeah. for sure yeah i think you know it's 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 similar principles to traditional selling where it's uh, you know whether it's scarcity or whether it's uh it's uh building a, a what's the word i'm looking for not reputation around it um anyway so somebody uh believe in what the heck you're saying so you know online it's you know as seen on Forbes, Yahoo, or, you know, A plus in the BBB, whereas like door to door, it might be like, Hey, I just spoke to Judy next door. Like it's still, it's building that, that trust there mm-hmm. to where very quickly you're like, oh, okay, I'm listening. But you know, today, some of the things that work best are, you know, it sounds silly, but it's, uh, uh, you know, it might be like me, like knocking on the screen or something. And, and you know, you're, <laughs> you're scrolling through Facebook and you're like, the heck was that? Where like, most companies today are running this beautiful reel of like do 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 do, and it comes in their company name and their website, and it's got great music and all. That. And it's like that you know it might work at a capacity, but when you're trying to drive leads under a certain cost, I would argue it's infinitely more cost effective to do something like the the knock on here or something where they curse within the first you know three seconds, or maybe they're you know they're they're taking uh, uh, you know cash and they're waving it in your face, where all of a sudden you're scrolling and you're like what the heck, you know, things like that, that, that are really like, you know, might, might be similar to, you know, when you're in the middle of a store, if you yelled help, or if you yell, you know, everybody looks, you know, they're like, what, mm. uh, things like that is it's like really your, your job online or in a lot of ways actually in selling in general is really to disrupt someone's daily patterns or get them out of their, their sequence of, of life. And it's, and it's, you know, how can you come in and stand out from all the other noise that, that people are getting hit with, with advertisements, cold calls, cold emails, uh, everyday thing chores they have to do in life. How how are you disrupting that? How are you doing something outside of the norm that other people are not? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really interesting take on it. And certainly, you're right. There's so much noise on the internet these days, and you get bombarded by all kinds of things. So we get, uh, I guess, we all develop a bit of a filter that says I'm just going to ignore that while I'm scrolling sure. through my feed and and looking at what my friends are doing or whatever it might be. So, yeah, so breaking that pattern is, is important. Now, how do, you, how do you do that in a way that you're actually reaching the right audience? So you're not, it's not like I call it spam attention where you, sure. you interrupt everybody and, and you probably antagonize a whole lot of people that don't need or are not the right potential clients for your product or service. How do you focus that on the right people? Yeah, great question. So I think a lot of it is if we're talking online, it's the audience set. So it's, you know, it's, and we can dive into that is how can we, you know, drill down to make sure that the people you're actually getting in front of are 
those right customers and those are lookalike audiences or, and I'll dive into that in a second, but really to answer your question, I want to grab everyone's attention and then I want to filter them from there. So I want to, mm-hmm. Hey, uh, are you a, uh, you know, 50 year old, uh, male from, uh, you, you know, uh, Arizona that, uh, is looking for help to, uh, you know, get rid of balding. Like, so I'm, I'm, I'm essentially, I'm grabbing attention of everyone first. It might be every girl yeah. in the world. And I'm saying, Hey, are you a man? They're falling off. Hey, are you, uh, you know, 50 plus falling off? Hey, are you looking for hair law? They're falling off. But the point is I got this net to now where I can trim. Whereas a lot of people start here and then they're like, how do I get all this attention? It's like, really your pool is this big and you're only grabbing that much, that much of that pool. Cause you only, you only, you first looked to drill down and then you look to get attention versus get attention and then drill down again. I say that with a semi grain of salt, but overall, like I, I would say grab attention and then drill down from there is especially how a lot of times, a lot of, a lot of these, especially if we're talking about the internet, how a lot of things get charged, it's on a cost per click basis. So it's only when somebody's actually taking action on your ad or they're actually going to your website. So you're essentially, uh, and it's baked into the costing model, but you're essentially getting those, that front end advertisement for free in a lot of ways. If you want to look at it like that, a Facebook ad or whatever that is like that view or that ad copy or that messaging is really for free. It's when they actually click through to your website mm. that they're being charged through. So that, again, that, that further enforces the grab attention and then drill down to actually qualify who, who the heck it is you want clicking from there. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's really good advice because, uh, and then, so the, the thing I take out of that is, so it's really important to, once you get the attention to then qualify the people in or out specifically to what it is that you've, your offer entails. you got it. And a lot of times I would, I would uh, say emotionally drilling down too. Right. So if I'm going with that, that, like, let's just say we've got a hair growth supplement, would say, you know, if you're a 50 year old man, that's really just tired of just getting like, uh, you know, looked over by a woman because you, they don't think that your hair, like it means that you're, you're good in bed, you know, like, boom, that's mm. like a very emotional drive down of like, who is the person I want to be talking to? Like, I want the guy that that triggers. Like, I don't just want the 50 year old man with hair loss. That's like poking around for it. Like, I want the guy who's like sexually frustrated because he's not getting the girls that he wants. You know what I mean? And who, who, yeah, who, yeah. yeah well, he, you know, he, he thinks it could be because of his hair loss. So, um, I would say that drill down to focusing on the emotional psychological component around that outside of just the lo- logical is equally as impactful as that grabbing attention. Yeah. So the person who's feeling the pain already, and if you can tap into that pain straight away and say, well, I have, I have the solution. I can take that away. You got it. Hmm. Okay. So, well, Let's take a step back and tell us what you do today with site flood in particular, but um, we'll sort of go wider than that later on. Sure. Yeah, we've, I've got a, uh, a holding company of uh, a bunch of internet properties. So that what that looks like is it's a bunch of websites that really at the end of the day are driving customers. So whether it's for e-commerce products or whether it's to drive a lead or to come in and sign up for a service or to buy a book or an ebook or something like that, it's really it, at the end of the day, the core of our of our portfolio is attracting customers online. Uh, and actually, as of really last 12 months, it's, it's just driving customers in general. We've gotten a lot more traditional advertising, direct mail, TV, things like that. But really, we're a marketing company that knows how to market specific products and services that we now have moved up the value chain and owned where, uh, you know, years and years ago, we were just a marketing company and then people would hire us on to grow their business. Now we've essentially hired ourselves on to grow our own segments of the business, things like that. So. Uh, that, that's really a, our, our major focus today is, isn't much different than day one, which is really just driving customers. Mm. And how long has site flood been in operation? Uh, I want to say about, it's been about eight years now, uh, since, mm. since I started it. And a lot of it was, you know, it, it, me out of, uh, it, you know, me consulting or, or things like that. And, and, you know, now I feel like we're, we've become a lot more robust of a team with an org chart and, and, uh, you know, growing, you know, month by month on team size and, and you know, overall size of the portfolio and all that good stuff. But it's come a long way over the years. Yeah. And how big's the team? Uh, I think there's about 35 of us today, uh, roughly, give or take a few people. Hmm. And how did you go about managing that growth over that fairly short space of time, really? Yeah, they have got kind of an interesting uh, growth pattern, if I'm, if I'm speaking transparently. We... I first started hiring on a lot of my friends and family. And a lot of that was for 
uh, the trust that came with them. And it's not even mm-hmm. because I was afraid of the trust, but it was like the loyalty and the idea around like, okay, I'm going to invest a ton of time, money, knowledge into these people. And I'm not afraid they're going to leave. And they very well could, and they could have, uh, but that for me, that's often that kind of reservation as a lot of business owners have. And I think as I look back in hindsight, it's obviously come with a, t- a tremendous amount of challenges as well, hiring friends and family uh, in, in a business. But uh, day one, it was really, it was find, finding a, uh, a loyal, I'd say applicable applicable lessons there that, that, you know, if you said start over from day one, it's I'm hiring off of character, not, not skill set from day one. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that was because of the size of the business and where we started. But I tell, you know, small business owners or people getting off the ground or entrepreneurs, uh, it really is to, to hire for character over skill set, which, um, you know, today where the business is, uh, I might disagree with that because we're at a point where we need to buy time more than we need to essentially get. I don't want to say good people versus time, but, uh, you know, day one, it was very important for people to live, eat, sleep and breathe our vision, our mission and where we're headed. And I think that's still very important today, but it was overly magnified uh, from day one where, you know, number two in the company, number three, number four, number five, if they were not live, sleep and eat and breathing as if they own the business themselves, this thing would have never taken off or gotten to the level it was today. So uh, we, we very much hired off of character. And for me, that was, you know, I, I, I thought, you know, if I'm going to surround myself with people friends, it's because I enjoy their character, their, their characteristics and qualities. Uh, so why wouldn't I want that in business as well, too? And a lot of the skills came with that very quickly because they were fast learners. They had low egos, uh, things like things like that. They had high risk, risk tolerances, just like me. Um, so a lot of those skill sets are, that I plugged them in to do rapidly came quickly to the point where they started surpassing those that have been doing it for three, five, 10 years. Uh, pretty, pretty quickly because, because again, you were taking someone who's theoretically not supposed to be in that position, but fits the character mold of who that person's great to be. And then, you know, the skill sets came with it. Mm. Yeah. Well, it, there's a really important point there, I think. And and also, you know, you talked about vision and mission. So I, I know that from what I've read online that you've got a very clear vision and mission and, and you actually state it on your website. So having people that share that vision and mission and long-term direction and also are a really good cultural fit. So you talked about the being lifelong learners and and the risk profile. So they're all cultural things that, that are really important. And then, of course, the learning aspect means that people, as long as they've got, you know, a bit of uh, basic skills, then they're, they're sure. capable of learning new things. Of course. Yeah. And I think to your point, the, the, the cores there is what I'm trying to get at more, more than anything. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying, you know, pull some guy off the street and you can, <clears throat> you know, you can make him into a, you know, you know, the top sales rep, but I'm just saying you don't need to go get the top sales rep, at least early on from another company that has a $250,000 salary and mm-hmm. plug them in in order for you to be successful. You can find someone that has, shares the same characteristics of the competitors, 250 K guy who, you know, you could pay at a discount, uh, who theoretically has the opportunity to be better than that, that competitor's top top sales rep. And I, I think uh, I'm living proof of that. I've got to see that firsthand with, uh, you know, a number, a number of different different team members where, um, it, you know, I, I didn't have the luxury that I, we have today to go get, you know, uh, poach the top guy from this company over here. But I also didn't fall into the fallacy that because I can't do that, my company will never be at that size. I, I, I knew I had to find, you know, well, what, what is not only the next best thing, but what's theoretically could be a better thing long-term. Uh, and, and, you know, that core and that, that uh, cultural and that characteristic fits, uh, I think, have proven out long-term to be better than the competitor's, you know, top sales guy, if we're using that analogy. Hmm. Okay. So what kind of customers do you work with? Uh, yeah. So today we, we, majority of what we drive is um, individuals looking for help with their finances. So uh, it's a lot of servicing centers and servicing agencies that can refinance on someone's home or they can help get them uh, health, health insurance that's more affordable for them or something along that is, is really where we, we've kind of focused and narrowed our, our efforts are, are really on helping the everyday, uh, not just American now, I guess, I guess a uh, person worldwide at this point. How can we help them uh, save more of their paycheck or put more money in their pockets um, through different uh, services that companies offer? And uh, looking at us as a vital growth engine for you know some Fortune five five hundred companies 
allowed us to focus on what we're great at and allowed them to focus on what they're great at, which is providing great services or products. And we've been great at, uh, you know, making that initial introduction. Mm, okay. And was that a conscious decision from the beginning or did that kind of evolve as you grew? Definitely molded over time. I mean, to, to start, you know, my, you know, my dream was always to, uh, actually be a personal trainer. I wanted to help people lose weight and realize their, you know, health, health potential and live, live good, clean, healthy living and lives. And I started realizing that a lot of that was, uh, exciting in theory, but practicality, it wasn't possible because their finances didn't support that, uh, ability mm-hmm. to live. They had to work through jobs, mm-hmm. um, or they couldn't afford to eat healthy or things like that. So, uh, realizing really what the root cause, at least you know, for me, it it became very clear that it was someone's finances. So I said, okay, well, if I want to solve this and I want to solve divorce and I want to solve depression, I want to solve anxiety, all these other problems, a lot of that can be solved, at least, you know, in my definition by someone's finances. So uh, really wrapping our, the team's head around that and kind of turning the boat and steering it into a very clear direction, I think help allow us to pick up a lot of these other social wins that we were really after at our core. Uh, We just, we, we just realized that there's a, there's a, 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 a better direction to drive the boat in to be able to accomplish all those things, not just one of them. Hmm. So how did you go about then once you, once you realized that and you said, okay, we've got, um, we've got an audience that is looking to make their money work better. If you like, um, I'll put that, sure. put it in those words. Um, how did you then go about identifying who you partner with so that you had the resources to provide information to people and put and put them in contact with you know service providers that might give a a better offering better value for money or cheaper or whatever it is sure yeah i think there's a couple things it was one was obvious the obvious ones right which are you know vetting vetting the product or service understanding you know where that individual who's the customer where they are today and you know which which places solve that best but outside of kind of you know uh, pulling into the onion deeper outside of you know the normal due diligence that someone would assume it's uh, a lot of it's like for who we hired for too it was the exact same thing as who we aligned ourselves with was you know do they have a high risk tolerance uh, do they have low ego are they really just uh, uh, you know trying trying to win they're not worried about being right like those all sound like silly things that are secondary but it's so mm. important when like you know, we might, you might be struggling for three weeks or a month trying to, you know, an algorithm changes or something goes in the wrong direction. You know, do you have a partner who's going to be there for, with you, you know, through the the waves because there's natural waves in business and life in general and who's going to stick through you through those waves was very, very important for us because we found we've ridden some of the highest waves and then some of the lowest waves. And some of our partners have been the exact same people through the highs and the lows of the waves. And a lot of that was the, uh, due diligence of understanding, you know, who fits our our culture really in a lot of ways, and they're just fitting our culture on the service or product side. We're fitting it on the marketing engine, um, and then a lot of things that that a lot of people don't. It sounds silly, but don't do. It's you know going in person and shaking hands, and and really, it's like what's the purpose of the trip? It's it's really just to fly out there and shake hands with you, just so we can see each other face to face and have a meal. And it's like that sounds so silly, but like yeah. when people look down, who might even be listening their book of business, like. When's the last time you've just made a phone call just to say hi, or you've just had a meal just to have a meal, or you sent their kids clothes or things like that. And it's like, you know, how are you really becoming integrated in their life and their lifestyle? Uh, and you're not just another expense on the P&L, or you're not just another vendor that they're just looking at uh, on both ends, you know? And, and uh, so I, I would really challenge everyone listening today is like, who is your, you know, your customers today or your, your wannabe customers? And are you just ringing them up because there's something, you know, business related there? Or is there like this podcast, like I'm not on here to sell anything. I'm just doing this as a give back. And you know, when are you, when are you doing that in your own, whatever that own form of what you, yours is for me? Oh my God, I might recruit someone great out of this. Or there might be someone who's listening, who's a partner of mine. Who's like, wow, I, you know, I didn't know that like, there's all these intangibles around, you know, buying, mm-hmm. buying kids, you know, Halloween clothes or something like that, that like, isn't trackably defined back, but doing those little things, I think just strengthen a relationship, whether that's recruiting an employee, whether that's, you know, finding a new partner or vendor or, you know, whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I love that on so many levels. And, you know, one of the things that we're all about is keeping the human aspect of the marketing really alive and, you know, not, not abdicating totally to the technology and using the technology to, kind of help you have more of those interactions that you described. So I think yeah. that's really great. Yeah. 
I also love the idea. I mean, you've applied what what we do a lot of in marketing is getting really clear about who's your ideal client and getting to know them yeah. at a personal level, even even before you've actually met every one of them. But then you know you you really understand them at a personal level, and then you can make that personal connection. So you've kind of taken that model and applied it to hiring staff and applied it to hire uh, to forming those partnerships as well. Well, you got it. And I mean, just to, just to elaborate a tiny bit on that too, it's even gets back to our marketing messaging. I just said, like, I'm just the, you know, we're just the guys on the other end, you know, launching an ad or doing something like that. But by saying those, you know, are you the the guy who's frustrated to find the right partner uh, that doesn't, doesn't find you, you know, sexually attractive. Like I'm, I'm essentially talking to the guy I, I want to be talking to in a very deep, intimate way. So even like, like you said, technology is very, like you and I are across the world FaceTiming right now, but you, you know, we could get very intimate. And now how do you do that across a million of views, me to a million people or however, yeah, yeah. You know, however many people will listen to this podcast. I think you do it by diving very deep emotionally to where you're connecting on uh, uh, outside of a surface level or deeper than surface level. So I think it, it, it doesn't only just apply to customers or vendors, but also, you know, your, your front end marketing to your actual, you know, who's the people seeing, you know, your messaging or picking up the phone when you're talking to them or reading your team sales script or, you know, whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful advice. And I love it on so many levels, as I said. Um, now, one of the things that you're very strong on is giving back and philanthropy. So tell us a little bit, you, you've kind of alluded to a couple of things there that you do at a small level, but I know you do a lot of bigger things. So sure. why is that important, first of all? And and just tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah, I think the um, importance around it is, I always joke, like those like, it's really, it's, you know, I probably spend five hours a week on something philanthropic, which again, doesn't sound anything crazy, but uh, uh, relatively speaking, I think, you know, makes up the over, you know, 10% of my time roughly on, on my, or my work time, I would say. Um, and I think those five hours are probably the most, the highest ROI time that I spend. And a lot of people are probably listening and you're like, you don't make a dollar out of that, but I, I actually think I do get the highest ROI out of it. And the reason being is, is a lot of it comes down to uh, giving me the appropriate perspective or uh, level head or, uh, relative field that, that I can now go apply for the other, you know, 45 hours of the work week or the other hundred plus hours of my life that now, uh, without that, it's very easy to bring an ego into work and start making ego decisions, or it's very easy to not have perspective, to be able to have that same empathy with your customers. Some of the stuff we were talking about, things like that. So, um, and if nothing else, you, you get, I think you hit a certain level that when, when you start, you know, um, realizing your financial goals, you start, start hitting a diminishing returns. I think it's like, a, th there's like a, a ton of studies around, like after you make $70, 70,000 us, like happiness levels kind of level off or even decline. Yeah. Yeah. And I, think, I think a lot of it is because, you know, an extra dollar for me, an extra $10, thousand, 10,000, hundred thousand doesn't move the needle as far, um, uh, for myself as uh, emotionally, at least, as it would, or excitement level as, as, you know, seeing someone who is, you know, a 20 year old kid who's saying, you know, I'm, I'm really starting to trying to start a business because my mom just got diagnosed with cancer and I'm trying to uh, create something to help those, you know, cure cancer or mm -hmm. to be able to make enough impact that I can afford her medical bills or help her relieve her, her medical debt over the next few years. And it's like, I'm literally getting the chills repeating that, that true story because it's like, I'm complaining because our blank, blank, blank dropped, or I have to hire someone for this, or mm. we had a mess up or spill. And it's like, this kid is literally trying to like help his mom's medical debt. Like it's, it's an incredibly impactful. So, uh, I mean, I, I guess I'll pause there. Anyone who I'd say it's the number one thing for people in general, but specifically entrepreneurs or even salespeople, you've got a very tremendous gift of being able to inspire and help those. And um, I, I would argue, you know, nine out of 10 people on this listening even probably are not, are not spreading their, their seed or their gift as much as they should be. Mm, yeah, that's a, a great call to action and I uh, love the story. And, and it's not, I mean, it's not necessarily just money, is it? It's like time or being, being there, sharing experiences, helping yeah. out with expertise. For sure. Yeah. And I, I, uh, I, I mean, I, I think you nailed it. I think you nailed it. I think it's, uh, you know, I've had a point where my time is, uh, I think for a lot of people, their time is, is the true currency, mm. uh, even outside of dollars. Uh, you know, we're all, 
you know, me and me and Bill Gates have the same number of hours in the day. So uh, he, he can never get more time than I can. So, yep. you, you know, you giving that a lot of ways and a lot of people are listening. They're like, oh, well, I don't want to go to a soup kitchen and start handing out that. And, you know, find that application in your own way. For me, at, at, well, you know, years ago, it was coaching basketball because that was a sport that I loved and I could, you know, I could push that passion onto kids and, and uh, I was good at it. And, uh, I, you know, I was able to, you know, still life lessons and things like that. Today, it's, it's you know, helping young entrepreneurs, you know, realize their their business potential, things like that. So um, for those listening, it doesn't just giving back doesn't necessarily mean I don't mean, you know, you need to go hand out blankets to homeless people, although that's great. And if that inspires you, that's what you can do. And if that's easy, it's awesome. Uh, do it, do something. Um, but, you know, whatever that is for you that you have a passion over, you know, are you, are, you know, are you giving back in some way to uh, younger people, more needy people, more, you know, whatever, whatever that is by your definition, you know, are you sharing your, your unique talents and abilities? Uh, are you sharing those today? So. Hmm. Great. And on a totally different topic, I uh, read recently that you've um, embarked on a new challenge. So you kind of taking on something completely different. I'm listening. <laughs> what what, what okay. was it? I was reading about your acting acting debut. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, actually, funny funny story about that. So I've got uh, a lot of internet friends who said, "I bet you I can make something go viral." That you're going to be you're becoming a uh, uh, an actor in Bollywood, and I said, "I bet you can't." And then next thing I know, I was on uh, I think I was on Yahoo's uh, uh, like uh, entrepreneur like uh, not necessarily cover page, but I was getting a bunch of hits. So that's hilarious. That's actually a a, a funny story. A friend of mine pranked me with. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Which is good. Oh, uh, anyway, I thought uh, there was a story behind that, like you, you know, you were no, I, kind I, of needing, I, uh, needing to stretch yourself in a different area, and <laughs> maybe one day I'm uh, I'm really enjoying the shit out of what I do today. I'm really enjoying my, my work. I'm enjoying the people around me and growing what we're doing, and then you know a lot of philanthropic stuff that I mentioned. So I'm enjoying that today. Maybe one day I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll make a more uh, bigger steer, but it does feel like small little pivots today of what I'm doing, but. Yeah, that's a funny one. That's good. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the, um, yeah, it certainly did go a little bit viral and it came up in my research and I thought, oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's funny. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been absolutely fabulous, Anthony. I really appreciate you sharing all these things with us. Um, now, I, I think it's a good point to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round, and it's designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions. Hopefully you'll give us uh, really insightful answers and inspire the listener to go and do something awesome today as a result. That's rocking. So what, what do you think is the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? <clears throat> Realize their own pain points for themselves. So I think in order to be innovative, I think some of the greatest innovators are uh, solving problems that they're firsthand feeling or seeing. So I think First, looking at where are there, what are things in your life that you don't like today? And that could be, you know, I've got to imagine the the founders of Uber, uh, you know, were hated taking cabs and they took a lot of cabs and they said, what's broken about this experience? And, and then they created something around that. I don't know if that's a fact or not, but I will say that I find a lot of entrepreneurs or some of the best businesses created solutions to problems they found firsthand. So uh, if you're going to uh, find uh, first steps, I think, in finding innovation is solving problems for yourself. Mm, yeah, that's I, I love that. Um, and a lot of um, guests that we've had on the show have, in fact, built a business around something that they, they built for themselves because they found that need or pain that they had and they solved that for themselves. And then other people started saying, well, you know, I've got the same issue. Can you help me? And and all of a sudden it was a business. Yeah. Yep, 100%. Yeah. And and in fact, you know, we're doing a little bit of that ourselves. So we've been running this podcast for over five years now. We've got great systems in processes in place. And a lot of people are asking us, well, you know, how, how can you help me with the podcast? So all of a sudden there's a, a business opportunity there. There absolutely is. You got it. I love that. Hmm. All right. Now, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Mm, the best thing I've developed to uh, develop new ideas is... I think early on I had this um, uh, idea that I needed to, you know, how do you create the next Apple or how do you create the next Uber or Facebook? And it's like, it, I, I was surrounded with this idea of innovation and a term that most people didn't really bring to me until, you know, uh, later years of my life or uh, this, this term of, of being a disruptor. And uh, literally, I, I remember the sentence and said, innovators get slaughtered, um, disruptors uh, conquer, disruptors win. 
And I was like, what does that mean? And, uh, you know, and I, I digested it and they said, you know, innovators spend thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of hours and millions of dollars to prove out a concept where someone can come along and do it 1% better. And customers are theoretically going to go to that guy or girl because they have a 1% better solution than the first person to market. Although there's a massive value to being first to market, there's also a bigger value, I'd argue, to having a better solution or product. Um, and, and I think a lot of times this person usually ends up winning out. So for me, it was this idea of like, how can I take something working and make it 1% better? It was like, even getting back to that Apple example, realizing like they didn't invent the cell phone. They mm -hmm. just, and they didn't invent the computer. They just kind of pushed it together. It's like even iTunes was created out of Napster and Napster went, got sued and went bankrupt and got in all this trouble. Meanwhile, iTunes just came along and was like peer to peer sharing of music. Cool. Let's do it. Um, and it blew up and then iTunes, but you know, so looking at a lot of like the greatest things today, even again, that Uber example, they didn't invent the cab. They invent, you know, they, they said, how can we make this 1% mm. better than the cab they're doing today? And so for me, my, my greatest, you know, quote unquote innovations or successes have actually been disruption and disruptors. And I'd argue most companies that people literally Apple gets, gets, gets coined, you know, the, the innovative company, I would argue they're not innovative. I'd argue they're, they're disruptors and they're, they're one of the best disruptors at that. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's an interesting take on that. And and I know, you know, thinking back to my corporate career where I had the experience of starting off in the photographic industry and as a hobby photographer, that was wonderful. But of course, that was in the time when digital photography was kind of born as a mainstream consumer product and all of a sudden things changed very, very rapidly. So that was quite a, a disruption. And, and in a way, it was what you said, uh, the the digital people didn't invent photography, but they came along and said, well, how can we make this better? How can we make it more convenient for people? How can we make it um, uh, quicker? I mean, there's a whole lot of things there. Yeah, 100%. Hmm. All right. Do you have a favorite resource that you use a lot? Uh, I would say a, a clarity.fm is the name of the website. Um, again, clarity.fm. And really what it is, it's a site where you can pay uh, subject matter experts for their time. So you can pay them a, a dollar for per minute, $2 per minute, whatever it is. Uh, and you can find some of the most world-class people uh, in in whatever uh, industry or space you're trying to learn more about to actually get on the phone with you. And these are people that you theoretically would not be able to reach or grab their ear for. And it's, it's really a platform that allows them to uh, sell their time for you in a mentor, mentee role. Um, so you get some access to some really high level people. Mark Cuban at one point was on the platform. So literally you could pay, I mean, it was expensive. I want to say 200, 500 bucks a minute to talk to him, whatever it is, but that's not, that's not normal. But point being is like someone like Mark Cuban, like, shoot, I would, I would take out a, I would take out a, a loan if I didn't have the money to talk to Mark Cuban for, you know, for 10 grand to talk to him for 10 minutes that, you know, that you'll make that back a million fold ideally, you know, over, over your lifetime, you know, de depending on how you apply it. So anyway, um, yeah, that's uh, clarity.fm is a solution that I've enjoyed for the last few years that I think is super underground and underrated. So I have mm -hmm. no affiliation to them other than I love the the product. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll have to have a look at that. I wasn't aware of that one. So thanks for that tip. Sure. Now, what's the best way to keep a project on track? Best way to keep a project on track, in my opinion, is <clears throat> holding people accountable, which I know is not a, a sexy answer, but <laughs> it's um, it's setting metrics in place to I ensure you're guiding the project in the right area. So whether that's deadlines, whether that's uh, time tracking to make sure you're actually spending the time on it. Whether that's again a project management system, if that's putting a manager in place, that's you know you're responsible for this. And uh, a lot of times it's hey, you know, uh, Jeff is responsible to make sure that X Y Z part of the project gets done. Jerry is responsible for this, so it's assigned responsibility. And then I find things get done because a lot of times a collaborative team thing is great, but you get ten people in a room and you're like, okay, let's. Um, draw up Q1's, you know, marketing plan. And it's like, eh, but if it's like, hey, uh, Jeff, you are responsible for delivering this at the end of the meeting. Jerry, you're responsible for delivering the creative. You're responsible for de delivering the audience. Like all of a sudden now people have a lot more niche direction on what they need to get done and you are tied responsible. And then when you review, it's like, okay, Jeff, Jerry, and Jane got their stuff done. Jack, you dropped the ball. What happened? It also allows you to identify where there's gaps in the project. It's not just a win or fail of a project. It's like, here's the things that won in the project. Here's the things that's lost. 
Do we need to fix these or replace these broken ones? How do we do more of the good? How do we apply this? Should we have someone else owning these next time? So uh, short answer, compartmentalizing the project, I think, is is the best way to keep it on track. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good outline. And I, th- I think, you know, what, what you were talking about earlier around bringing people on board that are a really good cultural fit and having the right attitude, I think that that's important in that as well, because you can put those metrics in place but the and the accountability but with uh if people have the right attitude then that works really well for sure Hmm. what's the number one thing you think anyone can do to differentiate themselves um get addicted to failure (laughs) i think uh being addicted to failure i think we're in such a society where you see someone driving a lamborghini um and you're like sitting on your instagram feed and you're like why don't i have that and uh, we become such a culture of success and you're defined by success and you're a winner by success and you feel confidence with success. I think when you find confidence in failing, like when you're, you're failing over and over again, you're like, I'm getting up and doing it again the next day. Like when that's the, that's the actual furnace driving that confidence, that movement, that growth, I think you've created a massive differentiating point that other people are afraid of. I think my biggest fear with success is is <clears throat> just that that switching of me not taking the gambles or the risk tolerance or the risks that I need to to keep moving forward because I'm comfortable. And I think that's where a lot of businesses and brands die or they get they get stale, the blockbusters of the world, things like that. Don't want to take those big swings anymore because they're so they're so comfortable with success that to put themselves out on a limb to to potentially have a failure uh, like the Netflixes or the red boxes before that have taken advantage of, uh, eventually the blockbusters die and they go out of business and they're gone. Um, so I think that addiction to failure and defining success by failure, which is, I think is, is the number one way you can differentiate yourself in this world and society that's now, uh, uh put such a high priority on success. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting take on it. And I think, you know, the, the key thing there, I, is, being adaptable, not being afraid of failure and, and having the courage to try different things. And then, you know, my, my view is very much like failure is just feedback. I mean, that's right. You're, just you're feedback saying, well, that didn't work. So what can I learn from it and what can yeah. I do different? Either fail or you learn. I agree. I'm sorry, you either win or you learn. Excuse yeah. me. Yeah, no such thing as failure. Yes. All right. Well, thanks, Anthony. This has been absolutely great. Now, where can people learn more about you and and your business and where can they reach out maybe and get in touch and say thank you for what you've shared with us today? Yeah, I'm I'm, uh, super active on Instagram. It's just my first and last name. And then also um, feel free to Google my name, get in touch with me on my site or whatever. And I'm I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has or uh, give any feedback. I get a, a tremendous amount of messages throughout the week of just different questions. And I get to uh, every single one of them uh, at some point or another and uh, in some capacity, they're pointing in the right direction if I don't have the right answer or uh, I'm able to lend some experience share. So um, I don't know everything, but I'm here to help. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for that. And we'll post links to the, your Instagram on on the social media and, and the site flood website as well on, awesome, uh, on the blog post. Now, Sorry. is there a, a one kind of bit of advice you'd like to leave the listener with today, particularly in relation to them being leader in innovation and in their field? Um, I think really just re honing in on the, the failure, the failure. And I guess just to take to the next level, it's uh fail fast. So um, for me, the quicker I can fail, the better it is. So what I mean by that is like, a lot of times people will go through and they'll go uh, get a supplier and then they'll go uh, boom, boom, boom. And then all of a sudden they'll have the product and it's like, they don't want anyone to see it. They're like, don't look, don't look, don't look. And mm-hmm. then they're like, I now have come out with the perfect thing. And it's two years later. And like the only one who said they liked it's their mom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> versus, versus like what my, my favorite story, and I'll make this quick is the uh, creator of the Palm pilot has a story where he, he didn't go out and source someone to create the Palm pilot or do this or do that or blah, blah, blah. He literally carried a block of wood on him at all times. And he would, uh, he'd pull out this piece of wood anytime he found a connection. So you and I would meet at the store and he'd be like, oh, let me get your info. And he'd pull out a piece of block of wood literally out of his pocket <laughs> and, he'd it like this, and he'd put it back in. And then when he needed it, he's like, oh, 
I want to meet up with someone, you know, he'd pull it out. And he was, he was essentially failing fast. He was saying, would I carry this block of wood? Cause it sounds so silly to carry this thing on us all day. Yeah, long. Yeah, yeah. But so like, you know, conceptually he's like, would I carry an object on me? Now most of us look at that as our third arm. It's like, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's you know, like, it's literally, literally, I just grabbed it. It was a half a foot from me. Um, but so he was proving that out. So that applying that same to your business where most people go source a phone manufacturer and then they make sure it's perfect and they debug the software and then they don't tell anyone or they don't show anyone because they're afraid they're going to think it's an ugly child versus like, or they're only asked their moms or their peers or their customers. You know, it's like, how can I get negative feedback very, very quickly so I can innovate uh, on what I'm doing and, and take that same Palm Pilot, that block of wood example. How can you apply that to what you're trying to innovate on today uh, to feel you know, very cheaply, very quickly, very fast, get learnings and say, oh, it's too big or I would use it or I wouldn't use it. And then, and then, you know, push forward, but always be seeking out those, those, those fast fails um, and then innovating off them, ideally not, you know, using them as learnings, not just seeking out the people that are validating what you're doing. Cause those are dangerous when you surround yourself with yes men and, uh, and uh, just validating everything you're saying. I want to be, even if I had, even if I was Apple, I bet you Apple, you know, a billion dollar company s- still purposely seeks out, the, the naysayers, the people that hate them. I bet you they spend more time on the Android users hmm. saying, what the hell do you hate about Apple? Uh, if not, sorry, I shouldn't say as much, if not more as they do as their current customers saying, what do you love about us? I, I guarantee the, the Android feedback is, is more important for them, yeah. the negative feedback. Yeah, I love that Palm Pilot story. And and you're right about you know, getting, getting feedback from people that aren't necessarily your fans because that's an opportunity to consider doing something different. That doesn't mean to say you, you might, you will, but you, it's input that is well worth considering. So thanks for that. 100%. Yep. Your competitors' negative reviews are the best place to start, I'd say too. If you're a business owner, look at your competitors, Yelp, their BBB, whatever it is, go start reading all the negatives and the positives and start seeing what people are actually saying you know, uh, that they hate or they love about it. And then really that's your answer. Oh, what do I need to innovate on? I need to find a, find a, 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 a circle, uh, you know, and a statistically significant amount of negative reviews on, you know, they don't ship fast enough or they don't do this. Like a lot of times people think they need to create the, you know, the, the self-driving car. Like hmm. sometimes you just need to pick up the phone faster or you just need to have an extra customer service rep to really be an innovator. Yeah. 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 That's wonderful advice. And that, that is a great source of, of uh, opportunity there looking at those reviews. All right. For sure. Thanks for that, Anthony. Finally, who would you like me to chat with on a future Nova Buzz podcast and why? Who would I like you to chat with? Um, probably, um, I would say someone from a philanthropic background, uh, judging by your, uh, you know, I think most people probably call it's, it's like, what does your audience want to hear versus what they should hear or, mm-hmm. do, or uh, is, is, uh, I bet you focus a ton on like the means of the world that are what they want to hear and are probably good for them to hear, but what do they need to hear? What's actually going to add the most value and help them. I would, I would put the, uh, the pill and the peanut butter, like they say for dogs, they, or what, you know, whatever it is, yeah, you know, yeah. they, they mask the medicine in the, in a dessert, like uh, maybe sandwich it with a couple, couple bangers of, you know, they're going to love with the yeah. ones that they should hear. And, uh, I, I truly think most people will find the most value out of, like, I, like, I got to hear Steve Madden talk about his uh, going to jail and the mindset around going to jail. And like, that was the most valuable podcast I've heard in the last 12 months. And like, if you just told me, forget his name, Steve Madden, just the fact that, you know, uh, the mindset of someone who was going to jail, like that I've applied in so many different weird ways of my life that I, I would, we'd have to talk for another hour to like go through. It's not because I think I'm going to jail, but just because it's like, just that thought process of like your life, literally your freedom getting ripped from you. And what that looks like, like I, I got more out of that. Although if you just said, Hey, this guy who went to jail, I'd be like, no, nah, I want to listen to how to grow a team to, hmm. you know, 200 people at scale, you know, but like that jail podcast, actually, I'm pissed. I even said that it was Steve Madden's. Cause you're like, Oh, that's why you listen to it. Like <laughs> it was just on the jail. Like, uh, I, I think that'd be great. So anyway, that, that's, that's who I'd recommend you interview next. Okay. Well, we'll take a look at, at that particular one and we'll see who else we might be able to find that fits that mold. I know we've had people on that, uh, kind of in similar areas that have built businesses and then they're focused on phil- philanthropy right now. And we've got a couple of guests coming up that have stories around jail, which is quite interesting. So I'm looking forward to chatting with them. Um, yeah. But yeah, so thanks for that. And thanks for yeah. sharing your time and your insights with us so generously today, Anthony. I really appreciate it. I, I enjoyed this immensely and learned quite a bit. 
also about how you approach things and how you've uh, grown site flood to be very successful and you know rapidly grow over that eight years so um, I look forward to staying in touch for the future and seeing whether you do actually end up in acting or <laughs> whether that was a, a hoax that's going nowhere um, yeah so all the best and let's keep in touch I love it brother thanks for having me it was a blast bye hope you enjoyed that insightful and informative conversation with Anthony and took something away from his episode. He shared a lot of valuable information today, particularly about not letting your ego get in the way and keeping perspective as well as dealing with failure. I'd love to know what you took away from Anthony's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Anthony Sarandria. That is A-N-T-H-O-N-Y-S-A-R-A-N-D-R-E-A. All lowercase, or one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Anthony Sarandria. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Anthony there, as well as links to the Site Flood website, his social media pages, and the other resources we spoke about in today's conversation. Remember to check out our Marketing Master mini class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. But most importantly, it will enable you in less than 30 minutes to gain absolute clarity about who your ideal client is and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. And if you'd like our help to go even deeper into marketing mastery or our help with producing your very own podcast, even launching your very own podcast if you don't yet have one, then send me an email to jurgen at innovabiz.co and we can set up a quick call to have a short conversation and find out whether we're a good fit for one another. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast where we've got some more fantastic guests lined up including Odette Barry of Odette & Co and Michael Van, the author of Buying Out the Boss. Stay connected with us by subscribing to the Innova Buzz podcast at innovabuzz.com forward slash subscribe I-N-N-O-V-A-B-U-Z-Z dot com forward slash subscribe. Make sure you never miss another episode. It would also mean a lot to me if you leave us a review because what you think matters. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions or questions you have. So go ahead and share them in the comments below the blog post for this episode. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating. Thank you.